Hi friends, good evening. When we ask a layman, what is obesity? Or oh, even many, many times when we talk in conferences, we talk about obesity in terms of the, the number, right? The BMI. We say any way that's more than the desired weight in relation to the height, which is in terms of the BMI, we call it obesity. And of course, we have spoken enough about BMI more than 30 being obesity for the Westerners and BMI more than 27 for the Asians for whatever reason. So we've been talking about weight that's higher than the height, which is in terms of calculation of the BMI, in terms of weight. This is something like when you talk to um, car enthusiasts or people who are into racing, you'll understand an interesting fact. Cars that are very fast from zero to 100, cars that do high top line speed may not be the actual cars that's the quickest on a circuit. So you cannot just take a car that's just zero to 100 as fast as just take the number and say, this is the fastest car. Or a car that's taken and say, this does the maximum straight line speed and call it a faster car. There are many more things. So when you get more technical, there are many more things you need to understand. Likewise, when we talk about health or obese, you cannot just take a number and say, this guy's obese, and this guy's overweight, this guy's morbidly obese, and you're going to classify based on that. Just this makes sense. Okay, layman, it's fine. You cannot get too 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 much. When you go to a mall, you want to check your height and weight and tell where they are, it's fine. But when we we are technical people, right? We are treating people, we are saving lives of people, we are operating people. I think we cannot again go by the BMI. And unfortunately, every single guideline in the world where we talk about classification of obesity or even a selection for a surgery, we're still taking a laymanish number when we're talking about obesity or selection for surgery. We need to go one step further into it. Where do we go one step further into it? We need to understand what is there within this weight. Only then you'll be able to understand what diseases it can potentially cause. Let us say, for example, somebody of 31 BMI who's like, like a big heavy weight lifter who goes to all the Olympics and wins medals for us, who just have muscle plumping everywhere, right? Is that obesity? And we say, oh, you're sick, man. You're going to lose your weight. He just cannot lose his weight. It's all muscle. If he's going to lose his weight, he's going to lose his muscle. That's a bad thing. So you cannot say that's obesity. So you cannot just say weight that's more than a particular point, but instead accumulation of fat more than the desired volume can be called obesity. Because at the end of the day, why we want to classify somebody? To stratify the risk of developing a disease or a problem later. So that's why we want to stratify somebody into obesity or not. All right. So in that sense, just talking about weight doesn't make sense. We as technical people need to understand the body composition every time we are talking about weight, which means the component of muscle and the component of fat. If the component of fat is way higher compared to the component of muscle, then that is called obesity. And if the muscles are going to be higher than the fat, then that is not obesity irrespective of whatever weight they are. It can be less, it could be high. Why does this muscle and fat? Why not bone and why not water? Because they are almost constant. If the, unless the patient is an osteoporotic or whatever, just leave bones and out of question. Muscles and fat decide the metabolic load and the metabolic capacity. The fat in your body is the metabolic load. Okay. And the muscle in your body is the metabolic capacity. So now, if the muscles are lesser than the fat, then it means your capacity is lesser to metabolize the load. The opposite, your capacity is higher to metabolize the lesser load. So if this, this gets imbalanced, you are metabolically prone or you're metabolically dysfunctional, leading on to potential metabolic syndrome. So that is why understanding the muscle volume, all the muscle weight and understanding fat is important to say somebody is obese or morbidly obese, or is this weight called going to cause morbidity? So this is exactly why a lot of people could be thin or could be normal as per weight, but their fat could be more and the muscle could be less. So more metabolic load, less metabolic capacity, 
they are prone to development of diabetes, what we call the thin fat Indians or the thin diabetics that you see in our country. So body composition should be an integral part when we talk about obesity, because that is going to decide how you're going to treat the patient. And please do not decide any treatment based on BMI. And of course, the best means through which you can understand this are the DEXA scans, but the DEXA scan availability is limited. So you can have the bio impedance or the impedance machines that's available where you can use and try to get the best ones in the market, not the small, small ones you hold in your hand. They're just not really accurate. You need the, the, the bigger, bigger ones. And there are a lot of studies that have compared against the DEXA scan. The sensitivity and specificity are reasonably good. A lot of clinical research studies are coming based out of the impedance analysis of body composition. And it is this fat for many unknown reasons. It could be diet, environmental, genetic, that undergoes a phase of a chronic low-grade inflammation. So this fat in our body, fat I mean, fat could be subcutaneous, fat that is visceral. But here we are primarily talking from the terms of the visceral fat. This visceral fat undergoes a phase of chronic low-grade inflammation. And whenever there's inflammation, there is an alteration in the cytokine milieu. Different kinds of cytokines are being produced. And these cytokines are the ones that is responsible for the chronic inflammatory phase that is associated with insulin resistance actually causing insulin resistance. How this happens, it's a very complex phenomenon, but I'm not great, great at that. Maybe you can check with your endocrine colleagues, but this is what happens. So this chronic low-grade inflammation crosses the inflammatory milieu, cause infl insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance is the basic, basic issue with the entire spectrum of metabolic syndrome. And of course, we know what metabolic syndrome is. A combination of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity is called metabolic syndrome. There are multiple definitions for that. The simple definition is having two out of these four is called metabolic syndrome for discussional purposes. But technically or patho pathophysiologically, chronic low-grade inflammation of the visceral fat causing an insulin resistance is called a metabolic syndrome. So that is why it's just not about presence of diabetes because we always talk about insulin resistance in relationship to diabetes. No, this is the primary factor behind development of other metabolic diseases, which is related to your metabolic syndrome, like polycystic ovarian disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are also component of metabolic syndrome, what we call the ovarian manifestation of metabolic syndrome or the hepatic manifestation of metabolic syndrome. Again, the hallmark is insulin resistance. Again, the primary reason being high visceral fat and high chronic low-grade inflammation. So whenever we talk about obesity, understanding of fat volume is the most important in relation to the weight, what we call the percentage of body fat, the PBF. If you take the body composition report, you look at what's called the PBF. That's the most important one, irrespective of whether they are undernourished or, sorry, or undernutrition or normal or overweight or obese. That's why any treatment of obesity should not be just loss of weight, but gaining of muscle. Because as you are trying to reduce the metabolic load, we also need to work towards improvement of the metabolic capacity, which is improve the muscle. How do you improve the muscle? By high protein load and physical workouts. Toning exercise to push your muscles. That is why any weight loss treatment, in any weight loss treatment, development of muscle or weight training or what we call the isotonic exercises should be an integral part of the weight loss program. Because many people just go on a diet and diet and diet and just keep jogging, jogging, running, elliptical, they keep doing that when they lose weight, they continue to lose more muscle also. Because whenever there's any amount of weight loss or significant weight loss happening, there is always a small fraction of muscle that is also lost. Even if you do a lot of work, if you really don't do much, the loss of muscle is also high. So as you're losing weight, it looks good. You're losing fat, you're losing more muscle. But what is happening? Your capacity is also dropping. Gaining capacity is very difficult. So when this is lost, people tend to rebound very faster because their capacity has actually dropped during the weight loss process. That is why this rebound is also very, 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 very fast. So understanding of this when you talk about obesity is very, very important. So now I think you would have, have a good understanding of how obesity because of this high fat content is able to cause diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diseases like polycystic ovarian disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease.
But as we talk about this, there's another important thing that you need to understand. This visceral fat is primarily in your abdomen. So the abdomen sends the omentum, the mesentery, the liver, etc. So there's a lot of this fat. These fats tend to get swollen up because of the inflammation. So bariatric surgeons, you'd many times you would see all this momentum that's too thick, you know, very difficult to handle, maybe ecumotic, you touch, it may sometimes bleed, it'll tend to tear. These are this inflamed momentum and fat. Sometimes the, the, there, is, there is called the inflammation of the mesentery, causing shortening of the mesentery. So when you do a Rowan by gastric bypass, the loops are sometimes very difficult to bring it to the supra-abdominal cavity. So this thickening or the inflammation of the fat causes a increased pressure inside the abdomen, what's called intra-abdominal hypertension. And this intra-abdominal hypertension is what causes the central obesity. Because when you touch all the central obese people on their tummy, you see it's, it's like, like heavy. Why? It's not the fat outside. It's the fat that's inside that's pushing the muscle outside. You, you might see it's not that it's all fat. They have this big central obesity. It's because of the intra-abdominal hypertension. And these are the patients because of the high intra-abdominal pressure when they lie down, the pressure is radiated towards the chest. The lungs are very, find it very difficult to expand. So in addition to the fact that deposit around the neck, causing a short neck, and for the tongue to fall back, the heavy tongue, they lead on to the obstructive sleep apnea. I will not get into the spectrum of, I mean, all the pathogenesis of obstructive sleep apnea, but this, because of its mechanical effects, causes obstructive sleep apnea. There's another entity where the too much of obese people have a central nervous system suppression causing obesity, hyperventilation syndromes. Let's not get too much into that. But in other than causing this inflammatory effects, it also causes mechanical effects in causing obstructive sleep apnea because of the intra-abdominal hypertension. I mean, the understanding of obesity on joint tissues is simple. Again, that's a mechanical effect because of the central tummy, the low doses increases, lower back pain is going to become high. And of course, because of the increased weight, they are weight bearing joints, primarily joints of the knees and the lower or the like uh, the LS areas of the spinal areas also tend to cause pain. So this is how obesity just by having increased fat is able to cause so many spectrum of diseases. And that is exactly why the, the topic that was given to me is why obesity is a disease. Because I was supposed to talk why obesity is a disease. And I, I was just going through Google. I just was just searching, what is a disease? What is the definition that people have given for a disease? I came across this definition which said, it is like a disorder of structure or a function in a human a disorder of a structure or a function in a human that produces specific symptoms or that affects a specific location, which means a disorder of a function that can affect a specific area. Now we know obesity is a disorder of function because of increased fat. Now this cannot just affect one specific location, but multiple specific areas as we just spoke to. And that is exactly why obesity is a disease. Even if you take the understanding of this and put it to the simple definition of what is obesity, you now understand why obesity is a disease. That is exactly why this topic was a great topic to start with. And of course, there is there's a lot more to talk on obesity is a disease with regard to hormones, with regard to gut microbiota. We can, we can keep talking a lot of things, but I didn't want to make it too, too complicated, too technical. I just want to give a brief understanding of why the whole session is all about and why do we talk about obesity? And uh, with that, uh, I, I come to the end of my talk. Hopefully I made some justice. Uh, thank you, thank you for your patient listening. Mm -hmm.